Good afternoon, and my special thanks to Siemens, to the American Hospital Association, and to the Health Forum, for whom I sometimes toil, for asking me to talk about a topic that people don't like to talk about. So, let's say it's about 1820, and you're a good stout New England whalerman, and you're out in the ocean catching whales, and all of a sudden, one of the whales decides to return the favor and smashes the heck out of your boat, out of your ship. Some of you escape to the one usable lifeboat. Four white crewmen, two African-American crewmen, a cabin boy, two women and their five children who were traveling as passengers. But the boat's overloaded. You have no food. You have very little drinking water. And someone is going to have to pay the ultimate price. But who should that be? Who is going to be sacrificed to sustain the others, whether by going over the side or by serving as a snack? Flash forward to the ongoing debate about healthcare rationing. Many Americans say, we don't ration. Other countries ration, Canada rations, England rations. Physicians facing the Medicare pay cut that Dr. Sorensen mentioned this morning, which we should really do something about, by the way, say they'll have to ration access to care for seniors. States cut services under Medicaid. In Canada, England, Singapore, Cambodia, Australia, and other countries where I visit, patients often have to wait for care. Rationing is a scare word. It's a taboo. But what's the truth? Well, the truth about rationing is that it is, healthcare is rationed everywhere because otherwise it can endlessly create its own demand. Most rationing schemes have to do with supply and demand one way or another. I've always loved this slide because the thing about whether it's supply or whether it's demand, it doesn't matter. The result is the same. In this particular case, it doesn't matter whether it's a shortage of trees or an oversupply of pooches. You've got a problem either way. Rationing occurs on the macro level, such as a state cutting dental services for Medicaid, unfortunately pretty common occurrence, and on the micro level, such as a physician explaining to an insistent parent that Junior's viral infection will not be cured by antibiotics. But rationing is not popular, and no one wants to be accountable for it, simply because when rationing occurs, someone often gets hurt. So what influences rationing decisions? Well, Senator Dash and Senator Frist talked about this a bit this morning. First and foremost is health policy, whether payment policy or other kinds. A recent example is the Supreme Court decision regarding Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act that Dr. Frist discussed this morning. Some states can act, can opt out. Some states did exactly that. As a result, millions of people who might have qualified for Medicaid are likely to remain uninsured. And somewhere at the end of a long cascade of consequences, a kid may die of measles as a result. But that was not the governor's intention. Dr. Frist had it right. Policy, which I've been studying for longer than some of you have been alive, Policy always produces unintended consequences. And when finances get tight, the usual practice is to throw people out of the lifeboat, most commonly the uninsured, although sometimes Medicaid or even Medicare beneficiaries. However, the Affordable Care Act could really rock that equation. It's not going to cover everybody, but it will likely add 30 million people or so to the ranks of the insured. The healthcare system is going to have to accommodate them. As Roy Scheider memorably said in Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat. <clears throat> the uh, other thing, and we've talked about this a good bit today, and we can always talk about it in my sessions later. Another factor that really influences rationing is the structure of the system itself. Tight managed care, insurer decisions, maldistribution of providers, or provider refusal to treat certain patients. And we can't dismiss practices that are stubbornly held onto by providers who simply won't change. 
despite science to the contrary. One of the early American computer pioneers who unfortunately has largely been lost to history was Grace Hopper, the first female American naval admiral, uh, the author of the COBOL computer language, and a bona fide genius. Grace Hopper used to say the saddest words in the English language are, I've always done it this way. It's something that we still have a problem with in healthcare. And we have the huge issue of personal preference. People who are for or against abortion and contraception try to influence their availability. Physicians practice less than optimal medicine because they're afraid of being sued. Patients choose DNRs or hospice or just opt out of the system altogether. Also, generally speaking, people don't like to wait. And there's great criticism of rationing schemes that make people wait. But David Naylor, who's a distinguished Canadian physician, has pointed out that having to wait does give the patient the chance to consider his or her choices. All of these are things that influence rationing. But generally speaking, rationing in most healthcare systems is not an optimal process, and unintended consequences dot the battlefield. So the question is, can we do it better? I believe we can as long as we are realistic, and the most realistic aspect of this is no rationing scheme is perfect. You might be a fan of unfettered markets, you might be a fan of a single payer system, but neither one is a panacea. The difference mainly for, between rationing schemes is not which one achieves perfection, but what the outcomes are. So how can we create sustainable, humane rationing? Here are a few suggestions. First, rationing should have a goal. It shouldn't happen just because no one was paying attention, and that happens all the time. Understand that particularly in this country, people value fairness above all and will accept a fair process even if it doesn't produce a fair outcome. My favorite story about this was when Bruce Springsteen was coming to Chicago after a long absence many years ago. Ticketmaster was overwhelmed with demand, and so they went to a lottery system. That's quite common for ticket distribution now. Back then, it was considered radical. And so they're taking, you know, television film at the lottery site, and one young woman who's dressed head to toe in Springsteen garb, I mean, she was probably wearing Springsteen underwear, uh, was weeping, and so the television reporter in the classic insensitive manner of television reporters everywhere shoves a microphone in her face and said, why are you crying? And her number had not come up in the lottery, but her remarkable reply was, well, I'm not going to be able to see Bruce, but at least the process was fair. Furthermore, Rationing criteria should be objective and not based on whim or personal prejudice. And clinical considerations should be first, which the clinicians would love to have you agree to. There's an initiative going on in this country right now called Choosing Wisely, in which medical specialty societies themselves are identifying procedures and therapies that should not be done as a matter of course for every patient. The program is somewhat controversial, but it is a bold effort to put the rationing of services on a scientific clinical basis. Also, the most humane rationing applies to everyone. The worst applies to the helpless. This is essentially the test of fairness. Although there's always going to be a millionaire or a famous athlete or a politician who can jump to the head of the line, I long ago concluded that we are better off worrying about the resources that go toward those on the floor and not to those at the ceiling. In other words, I don't worry about Bill Gates' health care. I worry about those of the care of the uninsured. And also, as Dr. Joshi was talking about outcomes and the clinical concept, tracking the outcomes of rationing would help. In some cases, and we all know this, we just don't like to say it, Limits on access can actually be an improvement. In other cases, the consequences could be dire. It would be nice to know. So what are the lessons of the long, long history of rationing? 
First, irrational decisions lead to irrational resource allocation. I could give you a zillion examples of this, but a recent one was a big time controversy over approval of a five figure priced drug that would at most buy four months of life for some men with terminal prostate cancer. When Medicare and private insurers hesitated about covering it, the cancer advocacy lobby expressed outrage and beat them into submission. Too many rationing decisions are made on the basis of emotion. Also, although a fair, prices is, a fair process is most likely to produce public acceptance of rationing, it does not guarantee a good outcome. The great ethicist H. Tristram Engelhardt has pointed out that in this life, this is just an absolutely brilliant insight, some things are unfortunate and some are unfair. Child number one needs a heart transplant. Child has good insurance, great doctors, access to care. They just can't find a heart in time. That is unfortunate. Child number two needs a heart transplant. They found a heart, but the kid's family has no money and no insurance because dad got laid off and couldn't afford COBRA. The transplant is denied, the child dies. Most of us would consider that to be unfair. In rationing, Dr. Engelhardt urges us, focus on what is unfair because the unfortunate is going to happen no matter what you do. As for who should be the focus of rationing, it's interesting. Years ago, I met Sir Duncan Nicol, who was Minister of Health under uh, Baroness, the late Baroness Margaret Thatcher. And he said, you know, it, he liked my work on rationing. I've been at this a long time. He said, in order for rationing to be acceptable, you need two criteria. One, you have to have a global budget, which is to say, you know how much money healthcare has going in. We don't do that. Other countries do. And second, he said, everybody has to be subject to the limitation. Interestingly, in this country, we do do it at times. By and large, our model for the allocation of donated organs has been a model for many other countries. And even though it's breaking down some with personal side deals being made, uh, I still think our organ transplant allocation process is something from which we can learn a great deal. But trying to get limits to apply to everybody in a country such as ours is admittedly easier said than done. It also matters, and this is a very important point, where the resources that are saved go. The public is going to be more accepting if the savings are not buying an insurance CEO a new yacht, but rather are building a hospital in an underserved neighborhood. Who gets the reward is very important to those who are making the sacrifice. Other lessons are, we've been talking a lot about transparency and accountability. Both are critical to acceptable rationing, but because of the fear of accountability, it's actually hard to achieve this. Also, don't underestimate culture. We haven't talked about that much today, but all healthcare systems are products of the culture from whence they came. So you have to ask, what do people expect? What are they used to? What will they accept? Many of you have probably seen the current AT&T uh, commercial in which the sort of older, you know, young gentleman, but he's a, an adult, is sitting with a bunch of kids and he says, who thinks more is better? And everybody goes, me, me, me. And one little girl explains it by saying, well, if it's something good, we want more. Unfortunately, in my experience in and out of healthcare, often we want more even if it isn't something good. It's harder to ration in more is better cultures than in self-denying cultures. Also, timing is everything. If you're going to have to limit something, you really should be careful about when you do it. It is easier to ration in times of shared sacrifice than in those when people are at each other's throats. Notice the difference between World War II and all of the rationing that came with it. And despite all of that, it was a unifying experience as opposed to the Vietnam War, which was divisive. You have to be careful not to miss the moment when you might be able to ration better because if you miss the moment, the results can be really serious. 
<clears throat> the uh, other issue which comes up is the history of rationing. I teach this at Boston University. It's a mixed bag. Sometimes it has worked well, sometimes it has not. But please understand, this isn't some ancient concept from the 1820s. This goes on every day. This clipping is from 2002 when a ship carrying Russian scientists and crew to the South Pole got cut off in the Antarctic ice and was trapped. They did not know how long they were going to be there. They immediately started rationing food and fuel. Now, they were all rescued. Some South African boats came and got them off. But uh, during the time when they did not know when they were going to be rescued, rationing seemed to, to be the most natural and fairest thing to do with the resources they had available. Which brings us back to that lifeboat you are all floating around in, caught in what philosopher Edmund Kahn called the morals of the last days, by which he meant a situation in which superficial personal characteristics don't matter. Paris Hilton or Joe the homeless guy, you're still stuck in that overboated lifeboat. So who goes over the side? Well, in theory, the choice can sometimes be obvious. We have here a rationing situation. We have four stranded sailors and a cow in a lifeboat. And the sailor has just finished examining a boat that floated up, and he is saying, rats, there's nothing in here but a useless barbecue, grill, charcoal, and matches. The cow is looking very nervous. And this obvious choice, by the way, might not be so obvious to animal rights advocates, and certainly doesn't appear to be the right choice to the cow. But in rationing situations when they are real, and particularly when it's in extremis, like when you're floating around in a lifeboat in the South Pacific, human beings trapped in that situation had to devise a means of deciding who lived and who died. I study lifeboat ethics. Everybody needs a hobby. And I have found that in most of these situations in those days, the first people to go were African Americans because they were not considered to be human beings. However, as these crewmen were free men, their murders were usually covered up, including the most ridiculous of all of the stories from the HMS Peggy, with a crew of 200, two of whom were black, and the sailors actually tried to explain their disappearance by saying they'd gotten into a fight and killed each other. Next to go would have been the cabin boy. Why? Because he was not a breadwinner and was undoubtedly an orphan. And then would have gone the women and children. That might surprise you, but the phrase women and children first didn't come up until the sinking of the HMS Birkenhead in 1845. And in that case, the women and children were the families of the troops the ship was carrying. Women and children were not breadwinners either. So we are now left with the white crewmen, and under the law of the sea, they would have drawn lots to see who didn't make it. And there are cases, in fact, famous legal cases where sailors were convicted for not drawing lots. But understand that within the context of their times and their beliefs, they tried to be fair. What they did was not fair, but they thought it was the best they could do. So in the end, thinking about rationing forces us to admit that healthcare does not want to be in the business of hurting people, yet how we set limits hurts people all the time. The stakes are so high and our processes are so flawed. So how can we create and sustain moral, humane, healthcare resource allocation. The best advice I can offer is that we should keep trying and heed the very wise and beautiful words of healthcare philosopher Daniel Callahan. The change cannot only be in our healthcare system. This change must come from the inside, from ourselves, those selves that must wrestle with the fact that we are both patients and would-be patients, hurting and needy, alone with our individual needs, and yet also members of local communities, families, and a larger society whose collective well-being gives our individuality a place and an enhanced meaning. A system that guaranteed a minimally decent level of health care for all, in turn asking each of us to rein in our private demands would be a decent and manageable one. 
that is not an impossible ideal. And even as we struggle with budgets and policy and the constantly shifting landscape of healthcare, it is an ideal that we should never lose sight of. Thank you very much. Thank you.